Well, good morning and welcome back to Musings of a Texas Preacher Man. I'm Scott Fisher and I'm glad you've chosen to study with me this morning. Now, what a week this has been. We've covered a lot of ground and things that for some have been difficult and perhaps a perspective on Scripture that they haven't seen before. We've been looking at the transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Now, this transition period was the 40 years between the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, which occurs around 30 A.D., until the 70 A.D. destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Now, different phrases were used by New Testament writers to describe this period. Phrases such as the last days, the end times, the time of the end, the end of the age, the latter days, the fullness of the times, the consummation of the ages, and the already and the not yet. Now, let me encourage you, go back and watch or re-watch the previous episodes that lead up to this episode. Study the scriptures. Test the scriptures. Wrestle with the scriptures. Listen, our goal is to know him, to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, Jesus spoke of this transition period prior to his crucifixion. He told his disciples in Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse that prior to the destruction of the temple, they were going to suffer persecution and would be hated by all because of his name. We pick it up in Luke 21, beginning at verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you. Now notice you, you, you. He's talking to his first century disciples right at the week before the crucifixion. He's saying you are going to be persecuted. You are going to be delivered to the synagogues and you'll be scourged in the synagogues. You'll be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake and it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I'll give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. Now here's a paradox he throws in, verse 18, yet not a hair of your head will perish. Now you're going to, some of you are going to be killed and you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be scourged in the synagogues, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Now, this is what was promised for Jesus' followers in the transition period. It, it, it's that period after the crucifixion up until the destruction of Jerusalem. That's the context of Luke 21. The temple is going to be destroyed, and we know from history it was destroyed. Not one stone was left on top of another. This transition period, he says, notice that their persecutors would be friends and family. Some are going to be put to death and some are going to be scourged in the synagogues. Now this was the persecution that Paul endured everywhere he went. It was at the hands of the Jews who rejected Jesus and the Jews who recognized Jesus as Messiah but refused to accept that the new covenant did not include the continued practice of Judaism. Now we saw in Galatians and Colossians, Paul's warning to the Gentile believers who were being pressured by the Judaizers to incorporate the practice of Judaism as necessary for salvation. Paul referred to that as going back to the elementary principles of the world and to the weak and worthless elemental things. And he specifically explained that these elements, these elementary principles, these elementary things 
was the practice of Judaism such as circumcision, observance of dietary laws, ceremonial washings, focus on physical bloodline, observance of special days, special feasts, new moons, etc. Paul equated the practice of Judaism, the Old Covenant, with being, quote, according to the flesh. And those who had embraced the New Covenant, free of the elements of Judaism, as according to the promise and according to the Spirit. Now, Paul states that just as Ishmael persecuted Isaac, with Ishmael representing first century apostate Judaism, those according to the flesh, and Isaac representing the household of faith, those according to the Spirit, Paul writes in Galatians 4.29, But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, Isaac, and Paul says, so it is now also. Those who are of the flesh, the Judaistic system, were persecuting those who were of the Spirit, the New Covenant. Now, this is the persecution Jesus was describing in the Olivet Discourse, and this is the persecution that's described throughout the book of Acts. I challenge you, go back and read through the book of Acts and notice everywhere Paul went, he was being persecuted, riots were being stored, stirred up, they were being stoned, thrown into prison, all kinds of heck was breaking loose against him. Now in Acts chapter 17, Paul, as was his custom, as he took the gospel into the Gentile lands, went to the synagogue in Thessalonica. Now we pick this up in Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. By the way, what scriptures do you think he was reasoning with them from? The, the only scriptures there were, the Old Testament scriptures, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Zephaniah, Haggai, Malachi, all of these scriptures are speaking of this promised Messiah who would come and was going to bring life from the dead. Explaining and giving evidence, verse 3 here, that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ is the Messiah, the promised one. And some of them, some of these Jews in Thessalonica were being persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks or Gentiles and a number of the leading women. But the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jacob, Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, saying, These men who have upset the world have come here also, and Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And boy, is there ever king of kings and lord of lords, and his kingdom will know no end. Well, they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. Well, Paul and Silas had slipped out. And they left Thessalonica, and they went to the city of Berea. And the Jews from Thessalonica followed him. They heard what he was doing in Berea, and they went up to Berea and stirred up an opposition in Berea. Now, the believers in Thessalonica continued to suffer 
intense persecution from these opponents of the gospel, so much so that Paul addressed their dedication in the face of intense persecution, and he reminded them of the hope of relief that was about to come to them. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up at verse 4. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction. Now notice this. For God to repay, repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Now notice the context of this statement. Paul is saying to these who were suffering intense persecution for their faith, stirred up by Jews who opposed the gospel of the kingdom, the new covenant, that relief was going to come to them and God was going to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Paul's speaking of the coming day of the Lord, the day of destruction of the temple and the Judaistic system that was about to happen. And they would see it and they would experience relief. Now look what he says, verse 8, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. that This soon to come day of the Lord was going to be both a day of destruction and a day of salvation. Destruction for those who refused their promised Messiah and refused to embrace the glory of the new covenant, instead holding on to the fading glory of the elemental principles of Judaistic practice. Now remember, in his Olivet Discourse, Jesus said that destruction of the temple was coming, and it would come in their generation in the lifetime of many of those who were hearing him speak, and that, quote, not one stone here in the temple would be left upon another which will not be torn down. Now this would be the end of the age the end of the Old Covenant era. So, if the Old Covenant era came to an end with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, that means that the New Covenant era, the kingdom, the promise made to the fathers, the heavenly Jerusalem also came. And you and I, through faith in Jesus, are made citizens of, of his kingdom and everything that was lost in Eden through the fall of Adam is restored in Christ. So what does that mean? We have unhindered access to the presence of God. We have the glory of Jesus and we are ambassadors of his kingdom inviting all people everywhere to experience the life-transforming encounter and life with him. Now that's the good news. <laughs> that's what we're about. Amen? Well, I want to thank you for studying with me again this morning. And if what I'm sharing with you goes against what you've always believed, don't be afraid or intimidated. Let the scriptures be your source. And we'll be picking up right here again 
on Tuesday morning. I want to thank you for joining me for Musings of a Texas Preacher Man. I hope you'll continue to join me on Tuesday mornings through Friday mornings each week right here as we continue to discover the truth of the Messianic Kingdom. Now why not click on the subscribe button on the lower right corner of your screen and you'll be notified in YouTube whenever a new video gets posted. And if you're watching on Facebook, please consider sharing this on your wall and invite your friends to watch it. Listen, that's how the message spreads. The more likes, the more shares, the more coverage it gets. If you saw it on Twitter, retweet it and encourage your friends to watch as well. If you live in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, why not join me on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. for Tuesday Nights in the Word? That's right, during June and July, we'll be meeting on Tuesday nights. Come out and join us. Well, I hope you'll go out and make today a great day and have a safe and blessed weekend. And I'll look forward to seeing you right here on Tuesday morning.